Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, as usual, I would prefer short and succinct questions and answers to match, please. Question number one is Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to reduce the spreading of sewage sludge. Minister Aileen MacLeod. As long as it is, as it is well managed, the use of sewage sludge allows us to recycle valuable materials in a way that is safe and environmentally beneficial. It should cause no nuisance or inconvenience to the general public. But I am aware that in spite of the existing regulatory arrangements, problems with unacceptable odour relating to the storage and spreading of sewage sludge do still occur. And that is why the Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lockhead, commissioned a review of the storage and spreading of sewage sludge on land in Scotland. Now, following, the recent following the recent conclusion of the review, the Cabinet Secretary is considering a wide range of recommendations which he intends to announce shortly. It is likely that some of the recommendations will require changes to legislation and we will, of course, undertake a public consultation on any draft legislative proposals. And these actions will address the issues raised by communities and MSPs in relation to the spreading of sewage sludge and lessen the impact on communities, particularly in respect of offensive odours. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Minister for that answer. She will be aware from the recent members' debate that the vile practice of spreading human waste has caused a sickening smell to pervade not just the Garnock Valley in my constituency, but many other communities across Scotland. Is it not therefore time to end this revolting practice? Minister. I am aware of the odour problems uh, in the Garnock Valley area, and it is these types of issues that I expect the review's outcome to tackle. I mean, spreading to land as a fertiliser is a long-established route for sewage sludge, recognised as the best practical environmental option due to its ability to improve soil quality, organic content and water holding capacity, as well as to provide nutrients for crops. But the important thing is ensuring that that is all done properly to avoid risks to public health and the wider environment. And that is exactly what I expect the review to achieve. Claudia Beamish. Presiding officer, I, I welcome the minister's uh, remarks and uh, I, I'm very, very keen as I'm supporting communities in the Glentagger X mining area in my region uh, to hear the results of the review. And there have been inconsistencies in the level of treatment of sewage sludge before spreading on land when there have been outages. And will the new risk categorization facilitate more rigorous checks by SEPA? And is there enough treatment capacity to ensure all sewage sludge is not just dried, but heat treated to kill pathogens and protect human health, if indeed we continue with this pr practice? Minister. Well, as the member will be aware, this was a Scottish Government-led review which involved SEPA and Scottish water officials. And over the past few months, the group has held discussions with communities, the sewage sludge industry, local authorities, and other stakeholders. As a member may appreciate, there's been a complex, quite a complex task, particularly in relation to existing legislation, guidance and practice. So it took a little longer uh, than expected, but also the fact that the members of the Sludge Review Group wanted to ensure that an effective package of measures would emerge from this process in order that some of the issues that led to the Commission in this review can be fully addressed. And I think one of the key recommendations is that SEPA should have the power to have an exempt activity, uh, such as storage of sewage sludge, stopped immediately and the sludge removed. Briefly, Margaret Mitchell. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can the Minister be more specific about when the review findings will be published, given they were due in August? And does she agree that a holistic approach is required to address this issue and that there should be a lead organisation to properly monitor and coordinate, uh, coordinate activities relating Min to Surya? Minister. What I can say to the member is that at the moment the review is uh, obviously been concluded and it is sitting with the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, at the moment. Um, and advice has been provided to the Cabinet Secretary around that. I can't give any more details around when that uh, consultation, when, the, when it will be formally announced, but I'm more than happy if the member wishes to write to the Cabinet Secretary to get some clarity around the publication date. Okay, well, Thank you. Question number two, response. Neil Finlay. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the impact uh, on the environment of fracking. Minister. The impacts of unconventional oil and gas in our environment, communities and economy needs to be fully understood. The Scottish Government's moratorium will allow time for careful examination of the issues 
and proper engagement with the public in considering these. The comprehensive programme of research that we announced on the 8th of October will include projects to investigate the possible climate change impacts, as well as the effects of additional traffic movements, site decommissioning and aftercare. Neil Finlay. A freedom of information response that I have received shows the government uh, and uh, government ministers and officials met 13 times with INEOS prior, prior to the moratorium in fracking, and Nicola Sturgeon met with them on the very day the moratorium was announced. And since then, John Swinney's met with them twice. Given, um, given this and the construction of the large holding tank uh, currently being built, isn't it clear that as soon as the election is over, the moratorium will be over and that fracking will begin in Scotland? Or have any of us just blown a big pile of cash on licences they will never use? Minister. Well, as I said, you know, ministers have held meetings with representatives of environmental, non-governmental organisations, with community groups, industry bodies and local government. And these meetings have helped us to prepare for the research and public consultation processes. And as a result, we have planned a robust and thorough research process and a wide-ranging and participative consultation process. Thank you. Question number three, Gavin Brown. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason there was a £13 million underspend by the Rural Affairs Food and Environment Portfolio in 2014-15. Minister. The Scottish Government consolidated accounts for the year ended 31st of March 2015 contain an explanation of major resource variances greater than £3 million for each programme within portfolios. For the Rural Affairs Food and the Environment Portfolio, this statement highlights that £7 million of the £13 million resource underspend was planned underspend on uncommitted budgets, such as research. £3 million was as a result of demand-led budgets, such as private water funding, and of the minor variances totalling £3 million, £2 million was a non-cash underspend, representing differences in accounting estimates in areas such as depreciation of assets. In total, this underspend represented less than 3% of the resource Dell budgets available to the portfolio and was used to help meet capital pressures. Thank you. Gavin Bray. Thank you. Obviously, the climate change budget sits within that portfolio. Um, why was there a £2 million or 12.5% underspend on the climate change budget? And given the importance of climate change, why have we had an underspend in the climate change budget now for four years in a row? Minister. Can I just say to uh, Gavin Brown that the figures within the accounts do demonstrate you know, the firm grip this government has on Scotland's public finances and our approach means that we are managing our budgets across more than one year. We carry forward some spending into the next year where needed, so such underspends do not reflect a missed opportunity to spend more on our public services. As I said, the underspend of £13 million includes £2 million non-cash that simply cannot be spent on services and it represents differences in accounting estimates in areas such as the depreciation of assets. The government's approach represents sensible budgeting reflecting fluctuations in costs and demand across the spending review period and ensures there is no loss of spending power in Scotland. Thank you. Tavish Scott. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As part of the budget, can the Minister tell Parliament when the cap payments due next month will be paid? And can she also clarify whether the reclassification of land affecting hundreds of crofters in Shetland will be affected by these budgetary changes? Minister. I do not actually have that detail in front of me at the moment. Obviously, I know that officials are working extremely hard uh, to make sure that we can get the cap payments you know, as soon as possible. Uh, I'm happy for the member if he wishes to, to write to the Cabinet Secretary for further clarification around that. Thank you. Sarah Boyack. Uh, thank you very much. And just to follow on that point, when will we know whether um, all the cap payments will be made in December or not? Is there a time that the Scottish Government has committed to us? Because farmers are already going to banks just to make sure that they um, don't have problems. Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As I've said, you know, the Scottish Government officials are working extremely hard to make sure that we can get the payments made you know, as soon as possible. And I say we're more than happy if your member wishes to raise that matter with the Cabinet Secretary. Question number four, Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in promoting the Scottish dairy brand to international markets. Minister. Uh, Richard Lockhead officially launched the Scottish dairy brand at the Anuga Food and Drink trade show in Cologne, Germany on the 12th of October. The brand and its uh, mark, which were unveiled by the First Minister at the Royal 
Highland Show earlier this year have been developed by the industry to raise the profile of Scottish dairy produce, to add value to milk and take advantage of the increasing international demand for products with a strong Scottish provenance. In addition, he is currently engaged in an official visit to North America, where he will be meeting with key buyers to help promote Scottish products, including First Milk's award-winning Mullock and Tyre cheddar. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Minister for her reply. Um, could she please tell me how many producers from, from across Scotland have now signed up to use the Scottish dairy brand and how many brands and products this includes? Can she also tell me how best customers can be informed about how to buy Scottish dairy produce and how MSPs might best help contribute to establishing the brand logo in the eye of the consumer? Minister. Well, I'm very uh, pleased to confirm that to date the Scottish dairy brand has 11 processors signed up with 18 brands supplying 40 different products over three ranges, heritage, artisan and organic, all of which are made using 100% Scottish milk. Considerable interest was shown from buyers at Anuga with around 20 positive leads and it is expected that some of these will result in firm orders being placed. Now, at the moment, uh, the industry focus is very much on the international market, seeking to tap into Scotland's enviable reputation for quality produce and building on our growing reputation as a land of food and drink. However, I am sure that in the future, the industry will also wish to raise the profile of the brand mark in domestic markets and would welcome the support of those in this parliament and elsewhere to promote our wonderful cheeses and butters. Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish dairy brand is indeed a laudable effort by the Scottish Government to try to help the dairy sector. But in terms of further help for that sector, I understand the Cabinet Secretary has decided to spread the relatively small amount of EU funding support available across all milk producers rather than just those who don't have direct contracts and they are the ones who are in most need. Is the Minister able to tell me why that decision was taken? Minister. I'm very happy for the, the member, if he wishes to write to the Cabinet Secretary, to ask for an explanation. Margaret McAuliffe. I'd like to ask the Scottish Government when and how it will report to Parliament the effectiveness of the Dairy Action Plan. Minister. The Dairy Action Plan was uh, launched by Mr Lockhead in March this year. It aims to improve the resilience uh, of the sector and to provide the right platform to ensure the entire industry can thrive in the context of volatile market prices. Uh, the action plan themes, of course, they include market developing, uh, promoting best practice in dairy farming. But these themes cover both the short and longer term actions and a comprehensive update on all of the recommendations contained in the plan was provided by Richard Lockhead to the Rural Affairs, uh, Climate Change and Environment Committee on the 28th of October and published on the committee's website. Many thanks. Question number five, Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government what contact is has had with the UK government regarding the impact of the disruption at Calais on Scottish food exports. Minister. Uh, Scottish ministers have written to the UK government four times about this issue and the Cabinet Secretary for Food, Mr Lockhead, has also spoken directly to the UK Minister for Transport. In addition, uh, Scottish government officials have been in regular dialogue with their counterparts within the UK government relaying our concerns about the impact of migrant ingress into the Channel Tunnel on the Scottish fish processing sector. Thank you, Krishna Lard. Thank you very much for the answers, Minister. The last update I received from the whole age industry is that Scottish food exports as a channel are facing increasing insurance costs because of delays and spoiled goods. Drivers have been have receiving some food parcels as a channel a few weeks ago, and office holders are telling me that the fence elected at Calais is just a gimmick. This shows a clear escalation of the crisis at Calais. Can the, cabinet, can the minister gather this evidence and highlight to the UK and French government the implications that the crisis in Calais and beyond is having on the Scottish food industry? Minister. Well, I uh, really do sympathise with the drivers who are facing uh, increased costs and insurance premiums. However, insurance cover is a commercial matter for the industry and our primary focus uh, remains to continue to urge the UK to play its part in a coordinated and comprehensive EU plan of action to deal with the humanitarian crisis. Now, the UK government has commissioned work to quantify the direct and indirect costs of the cross-channel disruption and to provide an initial identification of the implications for supply chains. And the Scottish government has also asked Scottish Food and Drink to work with the industry partners to explore uh, the potential 
for alternative transport routes from Scotland, and that could have the potential to reduce costs and create a range of mid- and long-term options for our businesses looking to export their products. Thank you. Question number six, Colin Beatty. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact on its climate targets are of the UK Government's energy policies. Minister. The Scottish Government remains committed to addressing climate change and as we look towards the negotiations in Paris later this month, we are committed to working with the UK, the EU, UN and France to secure an ambitious, robust and durable climate treaty. However, the UK Government's changes to energy policy since June will make the achievement of Scotland's climate targets uh, more difficult. Since June, we have seen a raft of announcements, many of which have, been, many of which have created uncertainty across the energy sector and which have been resisted strongly by the Scottish Government. These changes by the UK Government are, to say the least, uh, not helpful as we look towards 2020. And this view has been echoed by others, not least uh, Lord Dabin, the Chair of the Committee of Climate Change, who has specifically written uh, to Amber Rudd stating the uncertainty created by changes to existing policies and a lack of replacement policies up to and after 2020 could well lead to stop-start investment, higher costs and a risk that targets to reduce emissions will be missed. Colin Beatty. Can the Minister outline what discussions Ministers have had with UK counterparts ahead of the Paris Conference of Parties towards negotiating a new international treaty aimed at limiting global warming. Minister. Well, ahead of my uh, attendance at the UN Conference of the Parties, uh, I met the Secretary of State Amber Rudd at the Environment Councils in June and September to discuss our shared ambitions. The Scottish Government and other devolved administrations have been consulted on the UK negotiating position, and the First Minister and the Prime Minister have also uh, corresponded on our shared objective of an ambitious climate agreement and committed to continue working together on this vital issue. Thank you. Question number seven, Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it's making in considering a tail docking exemption for working dogs. Minister. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Food and Environment wrote to the Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environment Committee on the 26th of October to explain the Scottish Government position on tail docking. A case has been made to us for possibly introducing a very tightly defined exemption regime to allow vets in Scotland to exercise their professional judgment and dock spaniel and hunt point retriever pups only if they believe that they are likely to be used for working in future and that the pain of docking is outweighed by the possible avoidance of more serious injuries later in life. Now, the committee has replied to say that they would support a full public consultation on this specific proposal. And the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Food and Environment will therefore reply to the committee in the near future about plans for such a consultation. Graeme Day. Thank you. Can I very much welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to consult on what would rightly be a tightly defined exemption regime for working dogs only. But can I seek from the Minister an understanding of when such a consultation might be launched and how long it would run for? Minister. Uh, well, we thank the Office of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee for the letter of the 4th of November uh, supporting a possible consultation on a tightly defined exemption to the tail docking ban in Scotland. Well, obviously, we will reply to the committee uh, by the 11th of December as requested, and that reply will help us to determine whether to proceed with a consultation on this issue. Thank you. I'm calling question number eight, Adam Ingram, but I need short questions and answers, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the recent discussions it has had with the SRUC on the deployment of veterinary disease surveillance centres. Minister. Well, earlier this year, the SRUC consulted on the future of its disease surveillance laboratory network in response to a large number of concerns expressed through the consultation on specific aspects of the proposals. SRUC are now considering alternative proposals and they intend to bring these forward uh, for discussion this Friday at the Strategic Management Board for Veterinary Surveillance. The Scottish Government has been in close contact with the SRUC throughout this process. We will continue to do so to ensure that the provision of veterinary surveillance services continues to meet the standards specified by the Strategic Management Board. Adam Ingram. I thank the Minister for that reply. She will be aware that Auchan Crewe in my constituency hosts uh, one of the busiest disease surveillance centres in a livestock intensive area. Can she give me any assurances that this centre will be retained within the national network of centres? Minister. 
As I understand, the SRUC has indicated to the Scottish Government that it is no longer proposes to move uh, the Air Disease Surveillance Centre to Glasgow. Thank you. Very briefly, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Inverness uh, Surveillance Centre obviously has been uh, under threat, and uh, it would be useful to know if the Cabinet Secretary is going to listen to the uh, evidence from the SRUC and give it some time before he makes up his mind about what to do. Briefly, Minister, please. Uh, I'm sure uh, the Cabinet Secretary will do so, although the SRUC has also indicated to the Scottish Government that it is now proposing to open a post-mortem facility in the Inverness area to replace the Drummond Hill site. Many thanks. We now turn to questions. Justice and Law Officers, question number one, Hugh Henry. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it has taken to determine whether Police Scotland or its predecessor forces have monitored the activities of political activists, trade unionists and environmental campaigners. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. In response to Mr Henry's question on the 6th of October, I made it clear that the authorisation of police surveillance is a matter for Police Scotland. Scottish ministers have no role in that authorisation process. Surveillance activity is overseen by the independent judicially led Office of Surveillance Commissioners. The OSC carries out regular inspections of the relevant public authorities and makes annual reports which are laid in both this parliament and at Westminster. Any person who is aggrieved about any conduct authorised under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Scotland Act is entitled to make a complaint to the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. Information about the Tribunal, including uh, details of how to make a complaint, are included on its website. Hugh Henry. President Officer, it's typical double standards. When there were allegations that the communications of MSPs um, were potentially under surveillance, uh, SNP ministers had plenty to say. Indeed, uh, the First Minister called on the Prime Minister to act over MSP GHCQ uh, snooping. She called on him to declare whether MSP communications had been intercepted. Now, when it comes to political activists, trade unionists and environmental campaigners, surely, surely they deserve the same level of care and concern from Scottish Government. They can't be bothered to ask. I would ask, presiding officer, the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary to reverse this shocking complacency and at least ask the question. Cabinet Secretary. I'm, a, I'm afraid the Member is confusing a number of different issues here in terms of uh, surveillance and interception of communications. The issue which the member was referring to in relation to elected members is interception of communications. As a former justice minister, I would have thought he would have been aware of that difference and how that differs significantly from surveillance, which is dealt with under different legislation. In fact, legislation which was taken through and the safeguards that were put in place that legislation by his own administration when he was a minister uh, within it. And as I've set out, if there is a regulatory regime in place for the authorisation mechanism and any complaints that individuals have in relation to surveillance matters. That is also the case for any type of uh, anything to do with the interception of communications as well. And if the member is aware of individuals who do have a grievance, I'm surprised that he has not directed them to the regulatory framework which his government put in place in order to deal with anyone who has got concerns about these matters. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. An individual can hardly make a complaint about activity if they don't know that it's happening. Uh, surely we can all acknowledge some information which is in the public domain that Strathclyde Police, for example, uh, were caught uh, on tape uh, admitting the infiltration of climate change campaign groups uh, and attempts to disrupt their activity. Mr. Don't we question, all have a please? responsibility all of us as politicians, to set a clear steer, to set expectations about the appropriate use of police powers, whether it's surveillance or other attempts to undermine and disrupt legitimate peaceful campaigning. Cabinet Secretary. So, as I mentioned to the member, there is a re regulatory framework already in place that sets out the thresholds that are both the necessity and the proportionality of any type of surveillance which the police choose to undertake. So, for example, if it's a matter to do with direct surveillance, uh, then that's an issue that has to be authorised by a superintendent and above. If it's an issue which is to do with intrusive surveillance, then that's an issue that has to go to someone within Police Scotland who is of the rank of Assistant Chief Constable and above. 
and it also has to be signed off by a surveillance commissioner, independent of the police, before that can actually be deployed and taken forward. And if there are any issues about how they are conducting this, that is reviewed by the, uh, the judicially led Office of the Surveillance Commissioner. They deal with, they look at the process to make sure that that process is being appropriately adhered to by law enforcement organisations. And if they find that there is any actions which are not appropriate, then they can investigate that issue further and it can then actually go to an investigative powers tribunal to consider the whole issue in much greater uh, detail. So there is a reg regulatory framework in place at the present moment to deal with this. And as a member will be aware, the UK government intend to change that regulatory framework with the revising of the, reg the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, which of course will also have an impact on the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Scotland Act, given that the Office of the Surveillance Commissioner covers Scotland as well. A very brief supplementary answer, Neil Finlay, please. Um, the Home Secretary, Theresa May, has established the Pitchford Inquiry and undercover policing in England and Wales. What uh, correspondence has there been between the uh, UK government and the Scottish government to give Scottish people an input into Pitchford, or will there be a similar inquiry in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there is not, to my knowledge, any reason why someone could not make representations to that particular uh, investigation that's been taken forward. But of course, uh, you know, if the member has specific allegations uh, that he wishes to raise with me, he should feel free to do so. And I can ensure that they are passed on to the appropriate body in order to consider these matters. But I should say to the member, to date, having said a lot about this matter, he has not contacted me with specific allegations that he wishes to have investigated. Question number two, Cara Hilton. Thank you, President Officer. To, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to encourage and expand the use of CCTV video links for prisoner appearances at court. Paul Wheelhouse. Modernisation of our justice system remains one of the government's main priorities. The Digital Justice for Scotland, uh, Just Justice in Scotland, launched last year, seeks to promote and encourage the use of live video links between organisations in the justice system. Scottish government officials continue to work closely with justice organisations as they develop the use of video links between prisons and courts. Justice organisations are also working with the legal profession to encourage a greater use of the equipment that has been installed in prisons and courts for the benefit of vulnerable witnesses and victims of crimes as well, where appropriate for, uh, uh, for prisoners. In addition to appearances from prison, uh, the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill seeks to change the law and allow more hearings to be conducted via video link. Currently, only a limited number are allowed to be conducted via video, and the legislative provisions brought forward by this government will allow more hearings to be conducted by video link in future, where it's appropriate and in the interests of justice to do so. Cara Hilton. Um, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Given the fact that increased use of CCD, CT, sorry, CCTV video links for prisoner appearances could save millions of pounds every year, does the Minister share my disappointment that the figures for the last few years don't show any significant pick-up in the use of this technology? For example, figures released under Freedom of Information requests show that in 2012, CCTV links were used 259 times, and last year it was 260 times. So far this year, they've been used just 228 times. So what more is he going to do to speed up this process? Minister. Well, the first thing, of course, to say that uh, the figures for the, to, to date only cover the first seven months of the year, so the, the, the financial year. So we, we do have a position that we're hopefully seeing an improvement in the take-up rates. But I take the, the point uh, seriously that Cara Hilton makes. We'd like to see greater use of video uh, links where that's possible, both to help engagement between solicitors and, and uh, people who are in prison or, or, or waiting trial, and also to help victims and witnesses, as I say, vulnerable victims. Uh, we are seeing a pilot project on solicitors or prisoner video links, which is um, in a limited basis at the moment, and it only involves a certain number of uh, uh, pr criminal defence lawyers at this stage. In the region of 177 agents are, have volunteered, but only 40 agents are currently using it. But we do anticipate now it's moving out to a national rollout. We should see a substantial increase in take-up of the use of video link technology, and that will hopefully see uh, the, the efficiency improvements that the member seeks to, to achieve. Thank you. Question number three, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the Cabinet Secretary for Justice response is to reported concerns that some retail thefts are directly attributed to hunger. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, national crime statistics only report on instances of shoplifting. We're unable to centrally validate whether retail thefts are directly attributed to hunger. However, it is clear that major welfare changes and benefit cuts imposed by the UK government are driving more people to food banks. 
In 2014-15, the Trussell Trust Food Banks uh, provided emergency food parcels to over 117,000 beneficiaries in Scotland. Uh, we are doing everything we can uh, with the resources and powers that we have available to tackle inequalities and food poverty. This includes £1 million of Emergency Food Action Plan, uh, which helps 26 emergency food projects uh, to provide food aid and funds fair share, a redistribution uh, food uh, which redistribute, redistributes food from retailers to community organisations. Our total investment in broader welfare mitigation members since April uh, 2013 is £296 million. Pounds. Claire Adamson. The Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Um, there is growing anecdotal evidence and obviously newspaper reporting. And in 2014, Durham's Police and Crime Commissioner Ron Hogg said that um, crimes have been committed nationwide by people simply trying to live. Is there any possibility of cooperation between the police and charities to identify those who are stealing due to welfare reform and hunger and any help that can be offered to Cabinet them? Secretary. Well, I've got no doubt that the uh, Police Scotland would be more than happy to work with charities to try and identify some individuals who may find themselves uh, at risk of stealing because of the situation that they find them uh, selves in as a, uh, themselves in as a result of the uh, welfare reforms and uh, uh, hunger, and no one should ever find themselves in that uh, situation. I've, sa I've said uh, there, are no, uh, there is no statistical information around the prevalence in this particular area, and I uh, am very much of the view this is an area where prevention is much better uh, than finding its way into our criminal justice system. Uh, if the member has a, a suggestion uh, with regards to Police Scotland engaging with specific charities to try and address some of these issues, I'd be more than happy to make sure that Police Scotland look into these matters. Thank you. Question number four, Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Scottish Police Federation and what was discussed. Cabinet Secretary. I meet with representatives of the Scottish Police Federation on a regular basis and I was delighted to attend the first uh, Scottish Police Federation Bravery Awards uh, last week where those officers who had gone above and beyond the call of duty were recognised for their bravery. Every day our officers are presented with difficult, dangerous and challenging situations and it's so important that we pay tribute to every member of our police service who day in day out show continued professionalism and dedication in keeping people safe. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary, I know, is aware that over the last few years I've been dealing with a particular constituency case in relation to a serving police officer who was accused by his employer of breach of the Data Protection Act and fraud. He was formally acquitted earlier this year, the Sheriff stating that he was not sure why it was ever felt necessary to bring criminal charges in this case. Could I hurry along to a question, please? Yes. Will the Cabinet Secretary, at his next meeting with the SPF, raise the matter of other serving police officers who have fallen foul of data protection legislation? And whether the SPF view that the whole approach is just wrong is being addressed by the Scottish Cabinet Police Authority? Yeah, of course... Uh uh, President officer, I'd be more than happy to raise that issue with the Scottish Police Federation the next time I meet with them. This is an issue which was raised by uh, the member back in uh, March of this year, uh, in which I set out that I was prepared to ensure that there was further work taken forward in this area. What I can uh, now inform the member is that there has been progress made in this particular issue about the information uh, that uh, officers are provided with. Uh, Police Scotland now in conjunction with and in consultation with the Crown have introduced a new uh, redesigned training package as of July of this year for all officers and staff. Uh, this training uh, must be completed by all officers and staff and will reinforce the obligations the service has under the Data Protection Act 1998. It also sets out when officers and staff can access data and highlights the risks associated with data access. Uh, this enhanced package has been introduced to raise uh, officers and staff awareness and to prevent data access uh, that is, in line with, is not in line with the law. I am also aware that Police Scotland's Counter-Corruption Unit is also running a series of divisional workshops looking at the main areas of risk within the service, and the workshops will reinforce uh, the new uh, DPA uh, training with the aim to preventing breaches of the Act in the first place. Thank you. Question number five, Jane Baxter. 
to ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to reduce the reported £10 million that is lost in the share of court system by cases repeating stages unnecessarily. Paul Wheelhouse. The Scottish Government welcomes the Auditor-General's report on efficiency of prosecuting criminal cases through the Sheriff Court. The report acknowledges that despite overall reductions in crime, increases in the prosecution of more cases involving domestic abuse and sexual offences have caused additional pressures on courts and the wider justice system. By their very nature, these are complex cases that sometimes require more than one hearing. In response, uh, through the Cross-Agency Justice Board in 2014-15, we committed £1.47 million in additional funding to the Crown and Courts for extra fiscals, judiciary and administrative staff to address delays and speed up access to justice for victims and witnesses. And during the current financial year, we provided a further £2.4 million to ensure the efficient progress of cases involving domestic abuse and sexual offences. And this funding will continue in 2016-17 and 2017-18. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that criminal cases are managed as efficiently as possible. We will continue to work with justice organisations to speed up access to justice within Sheriff Courts. And we're also committed to implementing measures in the Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014, including the new Criminal Sheriff Appeal Court, which opened on the 22nd of September this year and is part of the package of reforms to ensure a more efficient and effective court system. Jane Baxter. I thank the Minister for that reply. Given that the number of summary cases completed within a time frame of 26 weeks is the only performance indicator of share of court efficiency, will the Minister commit to introducing more detailed performance indicators in order to allow the public a more comprehensive picture of how well our share of courts are actually working? Minister. Well, I certainly agree with the, the member that uh, performance indicators are important. We are um, obviously not wishing to be complacent. We know there's a lot of room for improvement, but uh, SCTS have confirmed that currently in over 95% of our share of court summary criminal trials are being set within the 16-week target. I know the member's point was about completion of cases as well. Uh, certainly keep that under, under uh, review. But the, um, the point being that uh, operational matters are obviously a matter for the Chief Executive of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. I'll, I'll raise this myself with with um, Eric McQueen, but uh, uh, the member may wish to, to also write to the, the Chief Executive to raise these points. Very briefly, Rod Campbell, as long as the answer is also brief. Um, Minister, uh, Aberdeen, Dundee and Hamilton managed to reduce uh, the cost of churn last year. Um, how can other sheriff courts follow suit? Minister. Um, improved performances uh, secured through collaboration with justice partners and local criminal justice boards are key to ensuring this is achieved. Uh, so the remit of local justice boards has been recently revised and all boards now support the sheriff principle in ensuring optimum performance is achieved from all courts, uh, across all courts, by challenging inefficiency and ensuring the best practices shared. I hope that answers the member's point. Question number six, Rosie Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support is available through the justice system for the protection of children and families experiencing domestic abuse. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to taking action to tackle the unacceptable level of domestic abuse in our society. This includes enhancing support for all victims of abuse, including children. There are a range of specific measures available that can protect children. For example, there are both criminal and civil non-harassment orders and civil domestic abuse interdicts uh, with the power of arrest that can be imposed by courts to protect those affected by domestic abuse, including where children are involved. Breaches of uh, such orders uh, by domestic abusers uh, can uh, lead to penalties of up to five years imprisonment. When children are required to give evidence in court, a range of measures are available to help reduce the trauma of the experience. The Scottish Government has supported a number of initiatives which tackle uh, domestic abuse, such as the Police Scotland decision to roll out across Scotland a national disclosure scheme for domestic abuse, which was announced in the last few weeks. I, th I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. He will be aware of the effect that domestic abuse has on children, um, on their security, resilience and self-esteem. And he will also be aware that access to children is often used to continue to perpetrate abuse when our relationship has ended. Does he agree with me that access should not be granted under those circumstances? And can, can he tell me what steps he will take to protect families in those circumstances? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm uh, very aware of the issue that the member raises and some of the challenges around these particular issues. And I'm also aware that there are uh, some of the third sector organisations have raised concerns around information sharing with uh, uh, Sheriff Courts when they are considering issues of custody um, as well. As I'm sure the member will appreciate, these are matters which have to be put before the court. And it is 
important, as is the case for the, as it stands for the court, is that the welfare of the child is at the centre of that decision making, ensure that they're ensuring that their welfare is appropriately protected. That continues to be the case and will continue to be the case in the future as well. But I think it's also important we make sure uh, that those who do find themselves uh, where they have been subject to domestic abuse that they receive and they are involved in whether it be civil or criminal matters within our court system, that they get the right support and assistance at that particular point and the right advice at that particular point. That's why we've provided further funding to the ASSIST project uh, and programme of work which specifically provides support and assistance to individuals in those circumstances where they have experienced domestic abuse so that they can provide advice and information to individuals. And that's why we've provided further funding to them in order to, to continue that important work. My apologies to those um, members who indicated both in advance and during their time in the Chamber that they would wish to ask supplementaries. I'm afraid today the questions and the answers were not succinct and I was unable to call a number of people. We now have to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 14768 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse on the Succession Scotland Bill.